All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming and welcome online. I know we have a number of viewers online also, virtual. First thing is silence your phones. Not unlike I, not unlike me. Okay. So welcome to Choice Partners uh, Vendor Orientation. I see some brand new faces that we've wanted to have as vendors for a long time. I see some folks that have been with us since the 80s, and we always talk about him. We have a, a, a mix of uh, vendors here and online. I'm not sure what the mix is, but but welcome, and hopefully we'll tell you a little bit about who Choice Partners is. It is really, we want your takeaways to be who Choice Partners is and how we can help you sell more. That's it. That's what that's what y'all are in business for, and that's what we're here to do to help you. So uh, with with uh, with that said, let's get started. And uh, this is our group. We uh, kind of cleaned up one day and put on some suits and some white and black outfits and, and uh, hired somebody, paid them 20, 30 bucks or whatever, and uh, got some pictures made of us. So that's kind of kind of our group. I think we've got 19 full time employees now and uh, we continue to grow. So uh, that's our that's our crazy group. Everybody looks happy there, but sometimes we're not so happy. Anyway, we have some new folks. This is just kind of an FYI. Uh, Brandy, who is uh, title executive assistant, uh, has been with us since June and uh, came to us from one of the school districts. Klein was the most recent, I believe, right? Spring Branch, some other ones. And then we've got Danielle Pereira. Uh, she is uh, doing digital filing, uh, digital file clerk. I don't know where anybody, uh, she's not in the room right now. Oh, she is in the room right now. Okay, well, we're not going to have the camera come over here separately, but <laughs> anyway, welcome. And uh, also starting the same day, Dewan Forstall, uh, contract billing clerk. So we have some new faces and uh, that continue with growing. Uh, we're we're uh, moving right along, and and uh, and changes are are inevitable and regular with our group. So anyway, welcome to some of our newest employees. Why is it not? Do I need to point it? All right. Why is it not going, Stephen? Yeah, there we go. Okay. This is a quick little. Uh, agenda of what we're going to accomplish today. As you see, uh, I'll be up here, actually becomes my standard part of my presentation is uh, we're running behind, but we are running a little behind. And I'm gonna try and get through some of my slides. I have about seven or eight slides and, and it'll take a little while and uh, try and keep us back on schedule as much as I can. And uh, then we'll have Growing your business, that's kind of the marketing, uh, navigating the website, helping you guys with, uh, you know, customer contacts, uh, how to use us, how to present yourself in a little different manner than you might have just said, hey, we just want to sell you something. Government purchasing is different. And I know some of the people in the room have dealt with it 30, 40 years, and they understand it. Some of you guys are very new to it. So it, it takes a little bit of understanding also. <laughs> And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about our vendor exhibit things coming up. Legal, you guys can read it. I just, uh, this is kind of what we're going to try and do. Then we'll have lunch and we'll try and get you out of here on time. So uh, the contract is uh, broader than just HCDE. We have, you know, our members include the school districts, cities, counties, universities, higher ed, colleges municipalities, not-for-profits, things like that. So there's, uh, we always like to say win, 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 a win for HCDE, a win for you guys and a win for them to save them time and money. That's really what we're trying to do at all times. All right. This is a little triangle. Actually, when Stephen talks about some of the uh, jock stuff, he probably explains it a lot better than me, but this is just kind of, these are the players in the whole situation is we've got, us as choice partners, we've got the member, well, choice partner slash HCDE, 
we've got the member, which you guys are going to call your customer. We call them a member of our purchasing cooperative. And then we've got the vendor, which are all you guys sitting in the room and, and online. Basically what happens, see if my little pointer thing works. Oh, shoot. What did I just do? There we go. There's an interlocal agreement that's executed by and between what's called Choice Partners or HCDE, Harris County Department of Ed, which is a governmental entity, and the member, the other governmental entity, or it's just or it's it's a uh, it's or just a standard agreement that's executed between not for profits that allows them. I'm going crazy. That allows them to use our contracts. It's a government to government agreement that allows them to use our contracts. And we're not limited to Texas either. We're na nationwide. I think we're in virtually every state. There may be a one or two or three off off the off states that we're not in, but you could say we're nationwide. We're in every state, whether it's vendor and or member usage of our contracts. <laughs> so it allows them to use our contracts. What you guys have actually done is uh, you responded to our RFP and were awarded, which gives you, we call it a hunting license, a fishing license, whatever you want to call it, to be able to take that contract and go to here in Houston, we say Houston ISD, KD, CyFair, City of Houston, Harris County, just the, you know, are, are there any of the small guys anywhere and say, hey, Mr. Government Entity, you don't have to go out and do this again. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to do your own RFP. We've already got everything that's legal, compliant, meets all, the, all your qualifications, competitively priced. You can start using us today instead of waiting three to six months to write your own RFP. So that's kind of... That's kind of the, the gist of the awarded contract. And then between the member and the vendor uh, is where the PO job order, or even sometimes separate service agreements, end user agreements, license agreements, we usually call those supplemental agreements, can and, and we recommend should be uh, executed. So <clears throat> you've heard me say HCDE once or twice. Anybody not know what HCDE is? And and I know there's probably nobody wants to, everybody's too shy right now. Anyway, right? Who wants to explain HCDE? No, just kidding. I know that'll catch a lot of people, but HCDE is a governmental entity. That's what my, that's who, that's our, our employer, it says Harris County Department of Ed. We are the choice partners division within HCDE, but uh, it stands for Harris County Department of Education. Um, it's been around for a couple of years since the 1800s, late 1800s. We're also a taxing authority, but they're what, what's called the lead agency also. The government, if you remember that little triangle, the government to government agreement, HCDE slash choice partners is the government lead agency writing the contracts and executing that ILA, the interlocal agreement, buying between us and the what we call the members, which are your customers, school districts, cities, counties, universities, those type people, who are also a taxing authority <clears throat> here in the uh, county. And there's there's a number of uh, uh, divisions and and departments that are within ACDE. And for sake of time, I'll leave that up there. You can look at it and read it. And a lot of them are are very. Uh, important and, and bigger than we are, but really just kind of know that Choice Partners is one of the divisions within HCDE also, trying to get us closer to back on time. All right. I think this may be my last slide, but uh, I think most people in the room have probably heard about our rebate program. And if you hadn't heard about it before today, you're hearing about it now. We have a rebate program, uh, virtually everything you buy that your customers buy through choice partners that we're offering a rebate on also. We're not taking any more money from you. We're not jacking the admin fees or anything up. It's just something that we're doing as a choice. Nice play on words, right? A choice to give back to uh, the members as a, as, a, as a thank you for, for doing business and also for uh, incentivize for them to do more business with us and with you guys. So uh, that's on the website. If you guys want to 
look at it or whatever, your members will probably maybe ask you about that. You don't have to be experts. Just say, yeah, it's out there. Call Choice Partners. I don't want you guys to, to, to feel as though you need to know everything about it. We've got a lot of field reps in the room that hopefully they'll talk to you a little bit uh, during breaks or other times and uh, and or Choice Partners folks can help talk about the rebate or, or inform your customers about that. Just know it's out there. It's first year of existence. It started 9-1 uh, of 22. It goes to fiscal year. It starts 9-1, ends 8-31. We're allowing the uh, members to uh, input their data into the portal until probably about 45 days after the end of the year, probably mid mid October or so. And we'll have uh, some good data to uh, to go from there. I think next we're going to have Janet Walks, assistant director with our marketing and client engagement, talk to you about uh, helping you sell more, navigate the website, a lot of a lot of different things. Questions just. Fire questions off, fire them off in the chat if you want at, at any point in time. You want this thing? Thank you. This Y'all can hear me, right? So this is our crew that we would like y'all to be able to, uh, to meet either during your lunch break, bio break, or afterwards. One of the things that we like for all of our vendors who are awarded is to be able to know exactly who their contract manager is. So if there's any contract manager in the room now, they're probably at the back. If you'll just stand up and wave your hand and then y'all can put a face with the picture that we've got up here. And that's everybody ready to serve you, except we do have one home that's out ill today. Other than that, you, you see a face and a name and we want you to get to know them. Come on in, sir. We got plenty of room right up here and there's food over in the back. So again, as uh, Jeff said, I'm Janet Walks. I work for marketing and client engagement in support of you and the Choice Partners Co-op. So we're here now all about y'all. That's why we invited you here. We want you to get the most bang out of the buck for the contract that you've been awarded. Some of you have been with us for a while. This is a refresher. You might have new staff on board. You want to definitely share them with them. The information that we're sharing with you today will help anyone in your admin with internal, or it will also help your external sales reps. So what we ask is, where do we begin? Some people say, well, we got this contract, but I have no clue what to do with it now. Well, when you're in sales, and I used to be in sales for a lot part of, a long part of my life, who do you start with? You start with who you know, a bird in the hand, right? So it's okay to start with who you know if this is the qualifier for any of your customers. It would have to be someone who is a governmental entity or nonprofit. To be a member of the co-op, you have to meet one of those two criteria. So anything that you go through your member list that meets that, start with them. But you're not limited to them. You can definitely go out and stretch. That's what this contract is about, is to help you open doors to selling to governmental entities. So that gives you an idea right there. And you say, okay, what's a governmental entity? It's a school district, university, or college. It could be, um, <laughs> I just went blank. I'm sorry. Yes, we have nonprofits that are available as well. And then you have your municipalities and your counties. So that's a very large area that you might not have as you're uh, in your database to start right now. So let us help you with that. And so members, non-members, we talked about it can go either way. This, this is what will happen. We're not going to uh, cold call for you. We're not going to go door knocking for you. We do a lot of advertising for the co-op as a whole. So on your table, right in front of you, each of you received what we call the CP seal. And let me show you right here. This is what you're going to use to advertise with. It does have a stand on the back. So if you go to a uh, show to exhibit or you're in some kind of conference, take that with you, put that out there. That's going to be your branding for your customers, our members to go, oh, I recognize that. I'm a member. I can go and, and deal with them immediately. 
So you want to think about two referrals. Everybody that's in sales knows that networking is what really gets you a lot of traction. Word of mouth, somebody that can vouch for or you, I've worked with them, or I know somebody who works with them. I like their work and what's going on. But I want you to think through the silos of even one of our members. So if you were to take a county and you said, I work with the transportation department in that county, but you know, I never went over to their admin side, or I never went to their IT department. That's where you get bandwidth within one contact, within one member, I should say, and then all the contacts in there. Don't think that you have to stop with just the one division or department that you've worked with. Think outside the box and share your good news because you never know who you talk to. Might know somebody else who says, man, I was just thinking we need to go out and procure this or that. And here now you brought me an avenue. We can do it without running our own RFP. Can you collaborate with a choice partner contract holder? Absolutely. Another reason we bring y'all together in this event is so that you can meet other vendors that have been awarded just like yourself. So if you sell copiers and you sell paper, hmm, marriage that could work, right? You just help each other moving forward. If you're not sure, take the time to familiarize yourself with our list of vendors. I believe you might have been given one in your handout, not just a list of members, but of all the contracts we've awarded. And it's a good way for you to say, hmm, look what I can do. You might go together on a marketing campaign, or you might just, <clears throat> excuse me, refer people to each other. It's a great way to get started. So this is where we're going to have you go to learn more about what benefits you have of yourself. We have member benefits, but we do have vendor benefits. And the vendor login page on the choice website, you'll see a tab at the top that says vendor login, or you can just go to the button that says vendor and drop down. It says login. You might see right here where it says set up a new account. Please do not use that. That is on there for our members, but for a vendor, you had a, an account login created. Whoever probably was your estimator or whoever responds to RFPs, they're the ones that created the password and login. You can go to them and get it. However, Occasionally, some vendors will say it's okay for us to have more than one login. That is totally y'all's own decision. If you do want more than one login or you forgot what the login is, contact your contract manager, choice partners, contract manager, one of the people we introduced when we first started. They're going to be your best liaison to help you get the most out of your contract. But once you're logged in, this is where you come to. And this is where we say is the backbone of the website for you. All of these buttons here at the bottom will provide you with more information than you, you would need to just go and call somebody every day. A lot of it can be found here. You do see that, okay, that green thing. Ta-da! There you go. You can look up and down here and then you'll be able to see some of our current activities. It helps you get started like, oh, look where they're going. Hey, maybe we should go to that conference because I'll tell you later on that in your contract, you are required to exhibit at least four to five times a year. You can do plenty more than that, but this is a good way to see where it is. But down here is where I'm saying those buttons are going to be your best bet. And right here, Marketing resources is where I want to get started because this is my part that I want to share with you. This is what the page looks like at the top. And as you can see, sorry if that's too loud, um, we have several links right in here. Those are excellent if you have not had much time dealing with governmental entities before. If that's a venue of customers that you would like to build, come here and see that we have this one right here. It says tips for marketing to governmental entities. And also right here, you can always get a current list of our members. You have one in your packet that's there, but that's only as good as when we print it. And we daily get um, multiple members adding. So we will update the list and that would be current for you. Now, um, here is the list I was telling that you can get right there is also will be an updated list 
for the vendors. Every time we have a board meeting, which is 11 months out of the year, we do not have a board meeting in March due to spring break, but we update our awarded contracts list. And that's where you can go to see, make sure you're listed there, that you're uh, listed correctly. And then also anybody that you might want to work with. Okay. Now, some of the marketing that's required within your contract, maybe you're not as familiar with it. Maybe it was somebody in the office, but we're here to teach you. So you can either go back and confirm with them, or if you're the one that did it, make sure you take this information back to your sales rep and they're aware. That seal that I just held up for you has to be on your website or your landing page. Okay, we want it prominently somewhere on your website so that when people go there, they will tag you with us. It's a great way to link them back and forth and it drives business. And what it does, it's not our business. We're all about you, the vendor and our members. We don't get paid by uh, clicks. What we do is the more they know you're affiliated with an avenue of procurement that makes it easier and quicker for them to be compliant with law and open up a line of business with the customer, then that's what we're helping you with. You also see here, oops, hello, sorry. Let's try this. I, I did what Jeff did, right? So here, I was just going to say... Um, Right here, the conference display seal, five events. At, in your contract, it says five events per year at least. And we have a list that we put on our website. We have our calendar of where we go. You're welcome to go where we go. But if it's not as relative to you, then find your own in your own industry. That's fine. But just make sure that you do and take the seal with you. If you need more seals, we understand things happen, or if you have multiple events at the same time, call your contract manager and they can get you more of the seals. All righty. Now, if this right here where you want to develop a strategic marketing plan, I think part of that was what you had to do to respond to the RFP. But if you want some assistance or you want clarification, we in the marketing division be happy to assist you with that. Now, we do statewide publications and we do targeted emails. So if you want to participate in any of that, you get with your contract manager again and, and they'll get with me and show you how we can move forward. So on that same marketing resources page, if you go down a, about three or four paragraphs, it shows you right where you can pick up this seal. And that's the seal you pick up. We have it in PNG form. We have it in a PDF. But if you need it in EPS or any other form to fit what you're doing on your website, all you have to do is contact me and we can get that to you. And there's the number right there. My phone number, I'm not, I don't get to hide. <laughs> So we want you to call us, make sure you get that. And so when you put it on your website, make sure that that seal links back to your landing page within a, within the Choice Partners website. And the reason we say that is don't just link back to CP's main website, because that doesn't drive business to you. You want anybody that's that interested that they Google searched you and found you to go straight to your website and not to a competitor. Now, here's something that's called free advertising. I say it's free because it doesn't have another charge to it, but it is part of your contract and your admin fee brings this uh, available to you. Become a featured vendor in our newsletter. We send out a newsletter, I think 11 months out of the year again. So that's 10 to 11 opportunities. And I say it that way because we have a few events that we always cover as the lead story. But if you as a vendor wanted to get your name out there more prominently, our newsletter goes out to every contact of every member and every vendor. So it's broad knowledge. It's just as if somebody had Google searched your company, you're going to get hit with that. So you can provide the pictures. You can provide the storylines. We have questions that we will ask. You respond. We draft the article. You review it, and then we put it in the newsletter, and it goes out. It's great advertising. And once it's done, it's posted on our website. So it's eternal. It's not like it goes away after 30 days. So if you're interested in this, there's some requirements. You can't just do it 
as a brand new awarded vendor. You must have been used by about three of our members or so and completed the project, been paid, and they're totally satisfied. Then you contact your contract manager, say, I'd like to be a featured vendor. And then he will say, he, she will say, is the seal on your website and does it link back to your landing page? If that's a yes, then the next thing you have to do is provide a, a form of campaign that you're going to do. If it's going to be email or if it's going to be a flyer, even if it's going to be a phone campaign, believe it or not, people still do that. I don't know about y'all, but get calls at dinner time every night that you're going, please don't call me. But you have a phone script that you're probably going to hand the people that will handle that phone campaign for you. We'd like to review that script. And what we're trying to do is clarify for you the messaging. We're not going to tell you what to say about your your service or your product, but we want to ensure that you're representing yourself well. We have had some vendors that call themselves members. Eh, not correct. <laughs> We also had some people that say, oh, yeah, we were um, we were given this contract, blah, blah, and eh, not again. We use the term awarded for a reason. Your company went through a lot of work to respond to an RFP, and they were graded. They were reviewed and selected. You were awarded a contract. So we want to be sure that when you are representing yourself in your marketing campaigns, it sounds the best. But again, anything you want to say about your own service or product is up to you. I might check it for grammar if that would help, because I have some people that don't always have a marketing team and we can assist you there. But uh, we definitely want to work with you. As soon as you meet the criteria, then your contract manager will give you a link and then you just do it electronically. You just fill it out, upload your marketing campaign material, and then it comes to us in our division. We'll review it. If we have any revisions, we send it back to you. We go back and forth till it's done, or maybe it's right the first time. And then, bing, we give you a contact list. Okay? So what this does right here for the article, what we're going to do on this is we have a list of interview questions. We would send it to you. You give us those plus some pictures. And we have to have some that are in horizontal landscape. And we can have others that are vertical just so we portrait or, or, or horizontal either way. But we have to have one that goes well across the top. So make sure that you have that and can work with us on that. And uh, then you're in the article. We write it, review it, you review it, and then we put it in. Were there any questions about that? Okay. We've had a lot of good success and some very happy vendors that were able to participate with that. Now, for a member contact list, a lot of it is the same. You do need to have the seal on your website. You do need to be able to share with us a piece of marketing collateral. And then you'll get the link from your contract manager and you will use that to send it to us electronically. We'll review it and then we'll be able to get it to you. And the list comes probably within a week to two weeks, generally a week or less, but we do have to have some time. And then you have that list that you can use with the list. You do get, um, an address if you wanted to do emails. I mean, if you want to do sale mail, we do have emails and we do have the phone number. So it's a complete contact list that you can use. I would like to say this right now that I have had some vendors that would get a list and send in something to be reviewed and then do their campaign. Then they'd wait three or four months and then send out another campaign. Well, I'm going to say within that three or four months, that list might not be correct and probably just going to say it hasn't been updated, which we get people off and on that that will move around. School districts are notorious for that over different periods of time, like right before school starts or right in the Christmas break if people leave. Cities and counties are always updating, too. So it's best and it hurts nothing. Thing. If you just call your contract manager again or contact them and say, I'd like to do another campaign, please send the link. We've got the seal on there and we've got new marketing material. We don't mind pulling a list at all, but it would be better for you. And one of the things we do ask is that any bounces that you get, please send them back to us so we can clean up our own website. We try our best to stay on top of the database 
but it takes it takes a village. So we appreciate your help. Now, I just want to briefly give you an overview of what your current customers and prospective customers are going to be able to access on our website. As a member, they have a login just like you do. And we always suggest that as a vendor, you train your sales reps or whoever it is on the phone internally or externally that they know this spot right here, set up a new account. That is for our members that they, your sales reps, encourage them to get a login. They cannot purchase from the website, but it's certainly going to give them access to more of the benefits like our get a quote function. And it's going to strengthen the relationship between you and that customer so that you can move them forward with um, the information that they need. So their member and dashboard looks very similar to what the vendor is, but the buttons have different things. Right here, they have access to that contract list, just like you have there, the awarded contract list. They also have access right here to the landing pages for each and every one of our vendors. And I will show you those landing pages later. But in those landing pages, that gives them your direct contact information. You saw where Jeff was showing you the triangle. We want to have a win-win-win for all of us. We're here to support the vendors and the members equally. So when that happens, this just strengthens the bond and maybe moves the, um, the purchase and procurement through quicker. Then this over here where we have get a quote, very powerful tool for our members, but it relies on you. And in your contract, it states that you must respond within 48 hours. That just helps take a warm quote request to maybe a hot lead. Okay. Then we have food down here and the order portal. And that's what our members use to register any procurement based on a CP contract. That way they can get a part of the rebate. This is what a landing page looks like, okay? This is at the top right up here, and you can see it has the website and the area that's covered. To some of our members, it is very important whether or not you only cover a portion of Texas or if you cover all of Texas or if you're national. So we list that, and we also list the CP contract manager. So the contract managers that serve you are also contacted by our members when they want some details detailed information. Over here, though, is where you get to say who should be listed here. If you as a vendor do not supply this contact information to your contract manager, all they can do is pull that information from what was filed with your RFP response. Okay, so if this ever changes, and you don't let us know, like if somebody were to quit or get reassigned to another division and they're not in sales anymore, you want to make sure this is the first person you call because it's going to be driven that way. Any questions? It's very important. So this is another one of our vendors landing page. What I want to tell you is that you can see their website and who their contract manager is, but come over here. When you come down the page, there's a due diligence button where our members can download everything it took to be able to award that contract. So your RFP, your, I mean, your RFP response, the bid tab, the evaluation form, the advertisement, we have much information in there. I'm not sure, Stephen, uh, correct me, I thought the complete contract is not there, but if it's needed, they just call their contract manager, right? In due diligence, Monique, oh, you moved it there? Okay, for a season, it wasn't. But I was just going to say, this is powerful to our members. So just be aware that this information that you responded is there for them to see too. But there shouldn't be anything wrong. What this is, is transparency. And that's what CP is all about. We promote to our members. We have trainings for them, just like we're doing with y'all right now. The more educated you are about the tools to your availability, then the stronger are going to be your activities towards closing sales or getting more customers or helping them learn what you have to offer. Now, this is the get a quote button I was telling you about found on the member dashboard. And in the get a quote, it's, it's very simple to fill out. They just pick the category up here at the top. And then within the category, they can select what vendors they want. 
If you're in a category where there's been more than one awarded, then they can pick more than one. But for a member, this is important. I would say any one of you in here who have been requested to do a quote, your customer has told you, oh, I've got to have three quotes for who I'm working with. At least if you've dealt with people in government, it's almost a requirement for probably 90%. But if we keep them in-house quoting to Choice Partners uh, awarded vendors, then they're ready to move right away. They don't have to go through the RFP process. And then they just hear in this box right here. So you're not responding to another RFP. Let me clear that. I heard somebody think this. <laughs> Hearing thoughts, right? This is not another RFP response. This is a specific quote request. So it'd be as if you were awarded for roofing, but then I said, I'm going to develop a scope of work. And with my scope of work, then you're going to quote me specific costs for my project. Is that clear? So you can see you're not responding to another RFP. You're already a vetted and awarded vendor for them to use. So after they put in what they want here, and then they come down, fill this out. Down here is a button that says product or service need by date. Again, not when the quote is due. In your contract, you are supposed to respond within 48 hours. We instruct our members, if we do not hear, if you do not hear from one of our vendors within that amount of time, don't call the vendor, call us. So now they've looped us in. This isn't a tattletale thing. This is all about trying to move your project forward. It could be that you have a technology glitch. What if your computer went down and it didn't come through? What if somebody changed and you didn't update the email? Then we reach out to you and say, hey, this email didn't get responded. They go, oh, that person left. Now it's this person. And so it just we just help facilitate it to move it along. It also does let us know what's going on, just so we know what contracts are important to our members. And then over here, fiddlesticks. Here we go. Sorry, y'all. Here, right here, it says attach a file. Now, a member might determine that a picture is worth a thousand words, so they can do Describe it here, but if they attach a picture, woo, you know, if I say mahogany to you and you give me redwood, I'm like, close, but no cigar. Or somebody says, I'm going to give you pine and I really wanted, um, what do they call that, blonde or something. So Y'all get it. <laughs> there can be different images for different things. Also, up here, where you could say, I've already been looking for this refrigerator. And I've got the specs for it. So instead of typing out the specs, they can just say, please quote a refrigerator according to the attached specs. And then they just attach it right here. So you could get quote requests any one of these ways. When they hit submit right here, we get a copy in-house just so we know what's going on and if they need help following up. You get a copy and then the member gets a copy. All righty. So that's the kind of thing that we call a warm lead, and y'all can jump on it right away knowing it came directly from a choice member. Any questions on that? We do have members that use this regularly, so I would be happy for you to say, oh, I already got some. <laughs> if there's anybody in the house that's already received one. Sorry, no time. We're through. <laughs> I changed the slide. Oh, time out. Y'all, y'all waited. So what, 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 we have one, we have one school that we work with and we, we have, what happens is we're getting duplicate quote requests. So we get one from the school and then we'll get one online from you guys. And I don't know if they're instructed to give that guidance or I don't know. It's, I'm getting. Okay. That sounds like a big technical difficulty because what happens when they hit the submit button here? They get a copy of what they go, should go to you, but we never ask them to send it to us too. The system sends it to us. But if you're getting two of the same quote requests, please call your contract manager and they'll work with our IT. We have had some glitches. I think the, you're saying that they're sending one from their email yeah, send and one, one from their email. Email. Side. They don't get one from the that, side. That, that's just a user error. They're sending it twice and they only get Yeah, and yeah, we do told them don't duplicate, you know, because it's so you so it's not our system sending it to it's them. 
And, and that could be, I thought it might be a difference between the person that needs it, like in facilities, and then the person in admin that does the POs. But if it's not, just talk to your contract manager and they can reach out to the member too. So we'll help you work, work it from both ends. All righty. Okay. So one of the things we want to let you know is there's many tools on our website for the vendors as well as the members. So you can go here under our events and it'll show you multiple things where you can either exhibit or where you could find us. Okay. It's right here under events and it's under a tab called about us. FAQs. Everybody's like, oh, your eyes gloss over. It's too much information. But I will say this to any of you that are newly awarded, familiarize yourself with the FAQs because it could answer and address many of the issues or questions you have. It's a great educator. So just some takeaways here. Review your vendor dashboard. That dashboard is going to be your lifeline with choice. Review the market resources page. Avail yourself of the links we have there that will help you do your marketing and our numbers on there so we can call and assist. This is very important to show how to get a login ID. Teach your sales reps and yourself how to do that so that you can do that when you go out and visit our member, your prospective customer. And then know your contract managers. They have the request link if you want to get a contact list. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. The question is, if you're a newly awarded vendor, how long does it take to populate the vendor dashboard? It should be instantaneous. So again, did you know who your contract manager is? Are you a food person? That would this blonde lady right here, Trisha, will be coming up. Ashley is out today, but Trisha is her boss, so they can assist you with that. And it could just be so. Before I leave, I just want a show of hands. Who in here does not know their CP contract manager? Okay, can y'all as contract managers see these people? Just these two ladies right here. I'm not going to green light y'all. <laughs> But they know. So not to call y'all out. It is very important that you know who it is. So before you leave, if somebody will come and meet with them and uh, what are y'all both from the same company? What company? Ma'am? Lab Resources. So that would be Stephen. He's right back there and he will come see y'all and say howdy. Okay. That's kind of how we do it in Texas. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Now, Tricia Prestige, you come on, come up. All right. You just want this? Okay. Any other questions or no? Good morning, y'all. I'm Trisha Prestacomo. Um, I handle all the food cafeteria related contracts. There's only one of you in here, so I'm not going to really dwell on those contracts. But I do have, I know there's some, not all of you are new um, vendors. How many of y'all have been to one of our shows before? Okay, great. Please, y'all, we, this is a great event. Um, we have up here, we have the Nutrition and Product Expo, which is my, my show on the food side. It is the 18th of October. It is from nine to one. Um, we have students from 1030 to one. It gets a little crazy, but they usually um, behave themselves. And then the next day is a vendor exhibit, which most of you would attend. And it is um, the 19th from 10 to one. So if you've not registered yet, you should have received one of these. Um, booths are 450. I think there's a little bit more information on that. Let me see. And it's at the Humble Civic Center, which is kind of up, um, well, it's in Humble, up by the um, Bush Airport. Okay. The information, it's really hard to read in your um, pamphlet I saw, but if you need help, if you want more information about it, you can contact me, um, Jane. She's not here today. She's traveling. You can contact one of us and we can help you get registered. It's very simple. Um, like I said, it's only 450. We normally have a couple hundred attendees. The vendor exhibit tends to be more purchasing directors, maintenance operation directors, and all their staff. 
Okay. The nutrition expo is food service director and their staff and select students. Do y'all have any questions about this? Okay. And then also um, every year we do a gold sponsorship. It is a great opportunity for you to have some one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one conversation with some districts in the area. It's mainly districts, but there are like some counties and stuff that do attend. Um, but basically what it is, is you already have a booth, so you're paying the 450, right, for your booth. But then also the night before the food show on the 17th, we host a dinner. Um, this year it's at the Federal Grill. And at the end of the night, what we do is we divide the check at the end of the night between the 20 gold sponsors. There's 10 gold sponsors from my side, from the food contracts. And then there's 10 gold sponsors from the other side, from the vendors. Okay. And, but honestly, you get to bring two people from your company. You get, I mean, I always say this, but Houston ISD is always there. I mean, how often do you get a chance to actually have some one-on-one -on -one conversation with Houston ISD with some of their staff? Cypher tends to attend, some of the larger districts tend to attend, so it's a great opportunity. Um, you also get, you know, your logo around, you get your logo is going to be on the t-shirts that we hand out to all the attendees as well. Um, oh yeah, also this year we do a theme every year. This year is going to be really cool. We're going to have some performers, but it's um, like, for those of y'all into comics, it's like DC Comics but it's CP Comics. So all of us are dressing up. Uh, Jeff, our director, he's going to be Superman. What are you, Steven? Batman. Batman. We got Green Lantern. What? Michael's Robin. I'm Supergirl. I don't know. All sorts. Okay, so it's lots of fun. We do a contest. This year we're doing our contest a little different. Overall winner of the booth contest for you vendors is going to be a free booth registration for next year. So Hey, it's 450 bucks. So it's a good deal this year. So anyways, if you have any more um, questions about either one of the shows, just can't get a hold of one of us and we'll help you. All right. I'm going to go really fast because I said there's only one of y'all here. Um, so I'm Trisha. This is my staff. All my staff is new, new, new. None of them have been here a year. I've been here 10. Um, but Ashley, the one, the blonde sitting down, the one that's sick. Um, she's your contract manager most of the time. I handle some of them, but if you need anything from any of us, please don't hesitate to contact. And then this right here is just a list of our food cafeteria related contracts. Does anybody have any questions? The shows, anything? Nope. Okay. Well, we appreciate you coming. Next up is Steve Gibson. He's going to talk about the fun stuff. Okay, uh, so step one in any type of uh, communications is, is get your audience excited. So let's hear it for Chick-fil-A! That's good. All right, who's excited about lunch? There you go. All right, so I, I like to start off with the jokes. I'm always a, a little bit shaky. I gave up drinking first of September. It's good for the health, and it's also only one day. So <laughs> without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, legal requirements. All right. Lots of fun stuff. Who, who, who really, you know, likes just getting into reading government code and statutes? Is there anybody? Uh, you work here. Anybody else? Anybody else really? You know? Okay, good. So we don't have to, we don't really have to talk much about that. Uh, who thinks it's a really, really good idea to introduce somebody who's not real concerned about it with a lot of legal intricacies? Is that good for sales? No. All right. We are keep it simple, stupid. That's it. K-I-S-S. Not, I, I didn't mean to call anybody stupid. I'm just, you know, that acronym. All right. Um, business foundations is a good place to start. Um, so, you know, what is this business? Why do we have co-ops? Both member and vendor are striving for a simple path to a successful transactions. There are a lot of laws and statutes surrounding purchasing. We have to keep people honest. We have to keep people from doing business with people who are felons. We have to, we have to make sure that it's been you know, openly procured, not brother-in-law procured. 
Vendors want to reduce the cost of sales. Members want to reduce the cost of procurement, and both parties are going to benefit by using an existing contract and avoiding procurement delays. So, very simple. And you can use the same language with the with a member. It's no guarantee the people you talk to are going to know anything about this. Are they in government? Yes. Are they in purchasing? Probably not. You're dealing with the stakeholders. You're dealing, in most cases, with people who are using the contracts. They're going to care about the what. They may not care about the how. They probably don't. At its essence, the cooperative contract is an agreement to supply IDIQ. Remember that. A predetermined product or service at a predetermined cost to a predetermined set of customers. That's our members, that set of customers. When you hear the word member, think customer. That's who we're trying to reach. IDIQ, in federal government speaking, IDIQ is an abbreviation of the term indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. In other words, we don't know what they're going to buy. We don't know when they're going to buy it. We don't even know who's going to buy. Um, so here's all the legal requirements that we're compliant with. It's just a summary. I don't even think we have all of them. We haven't even looked at this slide in a long time. So, But there's a lot on here that is really important to your members. Even if this language doesn't speak to you directly, it is important to the people who are buying because somebody has got to be responsible if it all goes bad. So they want to make sure they've done their job right. They want to make sure they've procured it correctly. So um, one of the things I like to talk about when you're trying to help the member, um, I mean, I want to say congratulations on your choice partners contract. Okay, now the hard part begins. And I say hard part, although it might be easy. So um, who wants to know the good news? The good news is, is that your process for selling this contract is really not going to change. You know, there's three important things I always say for every sale. You have to identify your customer. You have to identify their need, and you, you have to demonstrate that you are the one that can fill that need. Once you do that, the sale is easy, except in government. And that's why the choice partner contract comes in. Um, so if we were thinking orders of benefit, Think of terms, orders of benefit to your customer. Um, I like to think of a layer cake. So the first layer is always going to be help the customer. You introduce yourself. Find out, try to find out what their needs are. They might not be what you have, but you help them anyway. And if I can't help you, I will always guide you along to somebody who I think can if I know. Uh, second layer on that cake, help them get what they want. The third one, from you, if possible. Now, once you've done that, fourth part is easy. Now that you know that you're in the situation, how, how, how do I procure this? I like you. I want to do business with you. But I've got a purchasing department, and they're going to want to issue an RFP, or they're going to ask me where the contract is. This is where the fourth part comes in. Legal and compliant. Help the customer get what they want from you. Legal and compliant. You keep things in that order. Keep it very, very simple for them. Um, and, and like I said, it's, now the hard part comes in. You have to actually get out there and make those connections and build these relationships because it is very much a relationship game. We've taken the RFQ off the table in a lot of situations. The RFPs are great if you're in the purchasing seat and you've got all the time in the world and you want to identify everything perfectly and find your perfect vendor. But the more complexity you add to that, the more time goes into that. The Choice Partners contract is designed to move very, very quickly and get to the sale in the quickest way possible. Um, so we do legally procured contracts. That is a benefit to our members and never forget about that. Um, I mean, you do have some benefits of being with choice partners as awarded vendors, of course, but you're still trying to, you're still trying to make that sale. The co-op contracts is just an easier and faster way of getting it signed. Um, so benefits to your vendors here, less time and risk per sale. All right. Maybe you don't have to invest all that time. Now, if they're a whale, maybe you might want to. That's fine. It's in your prerogative. You have repeat business. You've been awarded a choice partner's contract once. We have 
2,300 members across the United States, 70% of them in Texas. You can use that contract on every single one that has a need that you can fill. More relationship sales, less RFPs to respond to. Uh, what's the fastest anybody ever responded to an RFP? I'm gonna guess it's not under an hour. There's a lot of time goes into these. You know, um, you can propose on needs that are never bid out. Co-ops have been established in Texas for a long time and in other states as well. If someone who wants something can buy it off the co-op without bringing in all the manpower and, and, and technical and language and contracting, if they can do that, why would they if they can buy off an existing contract? Um, not to exceed pricing is a part of your contract, and that can apply to all members. Um, do you want to negotiate? Well, I mean, you can if you want to, if it's worth your while, or you can say, well, this contract is designed to move really, really fast because there's very little margin in it for us. So here's our pricing. Thank you. And let it be there. You also have that pre-qualification factor. You've been awarded on a contract. You've been evaluated. You are not coming in completely cold. Uh, there was a survey done by the National Institute for Government Purchasing. And the three top reasons your government customers are using cooperative purchasing were listed. Lower prices, lower administrative costs, more favorable terms and conditions. And this does make sense. Um, on the terms and conditions, keep in mind that you will have a supplemental contract because we won't have every term and condition in your contract and ours. In fact, we won't have most of them. So you'll always wanna make sure your terms and conditions are agreed with the vendor. I mean, sorry, with the member. Now I'm going to speak a little bit about what I see in talking to both vendors and members of the reasons that cooperative purchasing is growing in popularity. Um, the first is that it's it's authorized, it's legal, it's even in, encouraged. You know, believe it or not, government does not set out and intend to be wasteful. They just happen to do it. But the governor doesn't really want, you know, 10,000 people procuring the same thing. They don't. So you can also get the project or purchase started immediately. For me, that's probably the number of reason why I see people going with cooperative contracts. I don't have time to procure it. You have established pricing, flexibility and convenience. You can shift procurement resources to more complex or needed areas, reduce your procurement cost and risk and work with established vendors. So uh, we have a variety of contracts, uh, food and cafeteria, Trisha's area, technology. If you have a technology contract, it's probably gonna be Monique. Uh, commodities and services, most of them are with me. And we also have facilities contracts and that's probably gonna be Michael. Monique might still have some of these. And we also have our latest contract manager, Tammy, who's in the back there on your jock. And Stephen Kendrick's gonna talk a little bit more about the jock. Okay, quiz time. I forgot about the giveaways. I wanna to apologize to everybody in advance, but I usually like to do some giveaways at the quiz time. But if you don't mind, shout out the answer anyway, if you know, and then we will find out who's right. So this quiz is called, how well do you know your contract? Question number one, it's a true or false. It's appropriate to offer better pricing or discounts to Choice Partners members than the contracted pricing. Okay. Well, wait, is the consensus false? <laughs> I love this part. It's, all right, question number two. It's permitted to add the CP fee to the quotation. Ooh, I see some puzzled looks. By the way, you do have the answers in your handout. Pricing may be charged at any time within the contract period. Who said true? Number four, new items may be added to the contract pricing. A, anytime, B, at renewal, 
C, following approval from HCDE. Who knows this one? Okay. Number five, vendor standard terms and conditions do not apply when using the choice partners contract. True or false? Okay. Y'all are on that. Number six, bonus question. What does IDIQ stand for? A, implied discount in quotation, or B, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity? B, okay, all right. Y'all are getting the government lingo. Now you can say it and pretend like we understand everything. All right. So here are the answers. It's appropriate to offer better pricing. True. You can if it's beneficial to you. It's permitted to add the CP fee to the quotation. This is a big no-no. We don't want to do that. Number three, pricing may be changed at any time in the contract period. False. Okay, who knows when we can change it? Renewal, yes. Renewal after review. We do go through a review and submit a cost price analysis. That's important on some federal purchases and any purchases regarding grants. We have to check all those federal boxes. So we do have to review that. Number four, new items may be added to the contract pricing following approval from HCDE. But the good news about that, we can do it any time of year, usually. All right. Number five, vendor standard terms and conditions do not apply when using the choice partner's contract. False. You do need to make sure, it's not implied that they agree with your terms and conditions. You do need to have that meeting of the minds with your member. Six, what does IDIQ stand for? Indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. Okay, I'm gonna talk real quickly and I'm gonna move on uh, because we have Lunch. No, it's not Chick-fil-A, but we do have lunch. All right. Reports detail the total dollar volume of sales of the contract for the previous month. So generally try to target, you know, the 30 days in a month or 31, whatever. If you let us know about the 15th of the next month, send us a report. Um, that's a requirement of your contract. It also helps us understand, you know, you know, are you guys using the contract? Um, are you promoting it? Uh, are you having success for it? Um, we don't keep everybody we sign up. Uh, we, we can't. Um, we have a minimum of about $15,000 a year. We try to hit every year on that contract. And when we start falling to the no, our accountants start looking at us. Oh, what, what are you doing? Why do you have any, why do you have this contract? It's not making any money. You need to close it. The vendor is responsible for submitting one consolidated report every month. It's a very, very simple thing to do. Um, so always do that. Your contract stays in compliance. Um, real simple. Uh, I'm going to show you what those look like. Okay, so. Whoa. Whoa, Nelly. Here is your monthly reporting form. Just put your vendor name on it. The time period. Dollar amount, member name, date, PO number, contract number. Contract number should be your choice partner's contract number. Okay. We just did an RFP for communication services. We awarded uh, about seven vendors. Okay. That contract number is 23035SG. That's the number you would put there. And send it to this email address, supply reporting at choicepartners.org. Okay, if you are a JOC, JOC is job order contracting, order construction in the public sphere on a co-op contract. We can't procure legally by any other means, but JOC, if you're a co-op. We have a little bit of a different reporting form. I'll let Stephen Kendrick talk about the ins and outs of it, but this is what that looks like. So just make sure to forward that you know, every month. Okay, in your organization, if you have multiple points of sales, you may need to have a person who is a good coordinator who can reach out to those points of sale. Hey, did you sell anything with the Choice Partners contract this month? Hey, did you sell anybody, anything with the Choice Partners contract this month? Did you sell anything on Choice Partners? 
you add all those sales up and you report those. Uh, the food is almost exactly like the commodities report, but there's a different email address. Okay, now we've come, this is our checklist. You've been awarded. Um, so now you've got procurement. Let's say you make a sale, you do the admin fee of 2%, the reporting and invoicing. And I think I've covered all those, but just in case I've missed, um, we do invoicing about once every three months. The way that works is we're going to look at your reports for the three month period of time. Usually if you have a different preference, maybe let your billing person know. We'll add that up. And we will look at the reporting fee clause of your contract and whatever that percentage is, usually it's 2%, but in some contracts, it may be different. We'll look at that percentage and we'll multiply that by your total sales in that period. And then we will send you an invoice and that's it. So if you have no sales in the contract period, well, it's, you don't get charged anything. There's no fees. If you are, then the uh, just check your contract for the administrative fee clause, which I think is uh, 5.30 in the contract. Okay, you do have a survey on your table. And if you don't mind, uh, use this P, uh, QR code and complete the survey and let us know. And I think Stephen also has a survey at the end of his jock. But right now I have got some really, really exciting news. Uh, it's, uh, they let me know lunch is ready. And we have about 10 minutes to go out and grab some before Steven starts his presentation. Everybody good? Well, thank you all very much. I so appreciate you coming. And congratulations if you're a new contractor. Really look forward to working with y'all. And let any of us know if you have any questions. My name is Steven Kendrick. I'm Assistant Director of Facilities and Construction here at Harris County Department of Ed. Um, and I assist Choice Partners with anything facilities or construction related. <clears throat> if you do not have a, a jock facility type contract, you don't have to stay for this part of the presentation, but you are more than welcome to. Um, you may be able to pick up a few of the tidbits, but please understand that construction law is very different than the laws that govern commodities and services, okay? And so there are certain things I'm gonna say in my presentation that will not apply to your contract if you do not have one of Choice Partners construction jock or trade jock contracts, okay? A couple of things I'm gonna to cover today is why job order contracting, maintenance versus construction, how that's defined, how you know which part of your contract to use, um, concepts including trade jock versus quoting and bidding, and then how to legally use a choice partner's jock contract. I would like to state that about 98% of everything I'm going to tell you today is based on construction law. It is not specific to choice partners. So if you have other cooperative contracts, the exact same laws apply. You should be doing the exact same thing. If you haven't, you just haven't gotten caught. Does that make sense? This isn't new, this isn't just specific to choice. Um, it is state law. So why does legal compliance matter, right? And, and the deal here is, is that different procurement rules apply, okay? So if I'm doing a maintenance project, I don't need prevailing wages. I don't need architectural or engineer drawings, right? I don't need performance and payment bonds. But if I am doing construction, the law requires all of those things, okay? So different procurement rules apply. Contracts not properly procured can be voided or unenforceable. Officials and officers who violate procurement statutes can be subject to criminal penalties. Public works contracts may trigger bonding and prevailing wage requirements. And these legal mistakes delay projects, jeopardize budgets, and result in cost overruns, and subject your client, the governmental entity, to financial liability to vendors, subcontractors, and sub-subcontractors. <clears throat> We've seen a lot of this happen during COVID. Um, 
We saw a lot of this happening after Hurricane Harvey, where wrong contracts were being used or being improperly used. It resulted in many of the governmental entities having their funds de-obligated and taken back by the federal government. So time and materials. If you're a trade, especially a trade, this is probably your comfort zone, right? Your time, your material, your overhead and profit, and there's your quote. But here's the deal. In Texas, if you're providing construction services, job order contracting is the only method allowed to select contractors for future undefined projects. Okay? What does that mean? If you're doing maintenance, you can still do time and material. Okay? But back in 2011, they took construction away from the services and commodity and moved it over to its own section. And when they did that, they did not bring over time and material pricing with it. Okay? They, they gave us several different construction delivery methods. Only one of them is IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. And what does that mean? That means that only one method does not require me to have a scope and spec and engineer drawings before I do the bid. Okay, so with job order contracting, I don't have a scope and spec. I put a contract on the street and I say, hey, I'm going to need some construction services in the future. I don't know when and I don't know how much, but when I need them, I need them today, tomorrow, next week. I don't have my four to six months to bid it out. Does that make sense? Kind of. I see. I see a look. So how many of you work in facilities? Okay, so most of the time when you're doing a hard bid directly with an entity, when they do that bid, they have engineered drawings or a scope and a spec, right? Choice Partners has no engineered drawings when we did our bids, no scope and spec. We don't know what the work's going to be. But we do a bid for construction services for any and all types of construction work that possibly come up for our members. That's IDIQ. <clears throat> so what is job order contracting? Um, it's a procurement method used for maintenance, repair, alteration, renovation, remediation, or minor construction of a facility when the work is of a reoccurring nature, but the delivery times, types, and quantities of work required are indefinite. Okay, that's the legal definition. So maintenance versus construction and factors to consider. The first factor is the only factor I ever hear anyone considering, and it's almost always incorrectly applied. Okay, <clears throat> It's like for like, and that's defined as not new or upgraded. So if I have a 300-ton train chiller, it reaches into life, I replace it with a new 300-ton train chiller, Am I doing maintenance or construction? Okay. I hear maintenance. Do I have anyone, any, any conflicting opinion? No? It would be construction. Because if you look at the definition of like for like, the very first thing it says is not new. And you are replacing it with a new chiller. The second part of that definition says, or upgraded. If I replace a 25-year-old train chiller with a new one, does it have upgraded energy efficiencies? Does it meet all the new energy codes and requirements? It's over, it's over $8,000 and it's mechanical in nature, so does the law require us to get an engineer? Do we have to do test and balance? It's over $25,000, we need a payment bond. It's over $100,000, we need a performance bond. Does it still sound like maintenance? Oh, and depending on the type of governmental entity, you might have to permit it. You have to bring it up to new building codes. So it falls under construction. Second thing that we're supposed to take into consideration is the scale and complexity of the project. Okay, and then the third one is the physical size of the object being worked on. And for this example, I like to pick on my roofers. 
Um, and, and the deal is, is if your client has a 10 by 10 shed and they're going to replace half of a shingled roof, they can probably get away with calling that maintenance, right? They're using the same shingles, scale and complexity is small, the physical size, 100 square feet, small. I'll take that exact same example, but I'm gonna apply it to a 500,000 square foot high school. Well, now all of a sudden, the roofing system is still like for like, but the scale and complexity have dramatically increased, right? Now I have roofing penetrations, I have curbs that I have to mop in, I have to ensure that the roofing is sloped properly and that the drainage is working correctly, right? And then the physical size of the object being worked on. I went from 100 square feet to 250,000 square feet. It is much greater. And that throws it over into construction. I will say there is not a nice clean list I can just give you that says what is maintenance and construction. It is truly a case by case determination. But these are the factors you could, should consider when you're determining if you are going to price out your time and material pricing or your unit price book with the coefficient pricing, right? So time and materials for maintenance, the coefficient with the unit price book is for construction. If you notice in this little diagram, a job order contract can be used for repair, maintenance, construction services, can be used for everything. A maintenance contract can only be used for maintenance. It cannot go the other way to construction. So if you have an HVAC contract, this time and material only, and you get a call out there and they have several end of life units that need to be replaced, you are not supposed to proceed under a time and material contract in Texas. Does that make sense? I'm not gonna tell you that there's not people out there doing it. And I'm not gonna tell you that they always get caught. But if there was ever a legal issue and it did ever end up in court, case law has already said that would not be a legal contract for that scope of work. So Jeff talked about this earlier, um, and please don't get confused. Again, if you're with commodities or services, um, don't get confused by what I'm about to say. But Choice Partners is Harris County Department of Ed. We are a governmental entity, okay? And we sign interlocal agreements with other governmental entities. And all that is, is it saying that we're going to share our contracts with them and they're going to share their contracts with us, okay? We're sharing the weight of the work of procurement. Then what happens is Choice Partners decides what the members need and they go out and do solicitations, RFPs or CSPs, for bids. They evaluate them and they award them, just like any other governmental entity that you work with. If you have a contract, you did something right, because not everybody gets a Choice Partners contract. In fact, we usually try to award 50% or less of the respondents. But here's where things are a little bit different for my construction people, okay? So most people consider the PO to be the contract. And that's true for every other procurement except construction procurement, okay? So in statute, they actually define a contract for job order contracting as a scope of work with the same terms and conditions and both parties signing it. They do not call it considered a PO. This actually got challenged in court. And, and based off the definition, the school district's argument was that they took the vendor, you, your proposal, they added their PO to it, and that was the contract. The judge ruled that what they had was a proposal with one party signatures and one set of terms and conditions, and they had a PO with another party signature in a different set of terms and conditions, but they didn't have a single document that both parties signed agreeing to the same terms and conditions. And the school district lost that case. Okay, so yes, generically, if you're doing services, products, the PO is your contract. 
But if you're doing chalk or construction, it is not. You need a supplemental agreement always to protect yourself. Jocks procured by cooperatives, okay? Um, the big bonus to you is, is that you don't have to compete against all of your competition. It doesn't go to every Joe on the street and get awarded to the lowest bid, okay? All of our contracts are best value, not low bid. That means we took in all your credentials, your work history, your references, and we wanted to see who are the most qualified to provide this service, not the low bid, okay? The governmental entity can decide to go to work with you today, get a quote from you, issue you a PO, and go to, and then you go to work as soon as you can get a crew out there, okay? That doesn't mean that they won't get multiple quotes. In the state of Texas, they have to get one, but they can get multiple, okay? What they should not do, they shouldn't invite everybody and their mother out there. You know, if you show up and there's two others, fine. If you show up and there's 10 others, that's really not how that's intended to be used. That you shouldn't work with them for three or four months and help them develop their scope of work and then have them go get quotes from two of your competitors. That shouldn't happen. If they're going to get multiple quotes, they need to develop the scope and work, get an architect or an engineer involved, and let y'all all know about it. Have a pre-construction meeting. Have you all come, or not pre-construction, pre-proposal meeting. Have you all show up for a site walk or however they want to do it. Y'all hear all the same questions. You get all the same information. But either way, it prohibits you from having to bid against anybody and everybody. <clears throat> this only satisfies the procurement method not the contracting requirement, okay? So we basically did what the state requires them to do, but I talked about that supplemental agreement with all the terms and conditions. They need to tell you what the prevailing wage rate schedule is. We don't know what it is. We didn't put it in our contract. Are they gonna do liquidated damages? Are they gonna hold retainage? You know, what constitutes a notice to proceed Substantial completion, final completion, what closeout documents do they want? Okay, all that stuff needs to be in that supplemental agreement between you and them. Toys Partners doesn't have anything to do with any of that. We don't know. <clears throat> I've referenced where in statute it requires that written and signed job order. So I always operate off trust but verify. Um, I have references on every one of my slides, so you can go back and look all of this information up for yourself. Job order contracting is the only construction method, delivery method allowed in Texas, okay? Some state agencies have other construction delivery methods, and other states have other construction delivery methods. But here in Texas, um, if you're using a co-op, the only one that you can use is job order contracting. So what should be on the estimate, okay? It needs the Choice Partners contract number on it, okay? Every time. A line item assessment based on the unit price book. So we named, I wanna say four unit price books, RS Means, Craftsman National Construction Cost Estimator, Sierra West, and Xactimate, okay? You can use any of those four as long as you bid a coefficient for each one of them. If you only bid a coefficient for RS means, then you can only use RS means. But if you bid a coefficient for all of them, then you have your choice of which one you wanna use. The benefit to this is, is certain clients have a preference. If you're working on an insurance job, they almost always want Xactimate. You're working with FEMA, they almost always want RS means. Uh, for my people online, if you're working out in California, Sierra West and K through 12 is a requirement. <clears throat> you should localize it by applying the city cost index. So these unit price books are based on national average. And then you apply the city cost index to either increase or decrease the pricing for the area that you're working in. Does that make sense? I'll show you what that looks like here in a minute. And then the last thing is your legally bid coefficient, okay? 
What's a coefficient? It's basically the opposite of a percent off. So it's a multiplier based on 1.0. If I have a $5 plug and I multiply it by one, it's $5, right? If I bid a 0 0.9, 0 0.9 times $5 is 10% off, so it's 450. If I bid a 1.1, then I'm increasing the dollar by 10%. Does that make sense? <laughs> Subcontractor pricing must be estimated using the unit price book for all scopes of work. So even if you are a single trade, maybe you have an MEP contract, okay? Um, you still have to line item out anything you subcontract out. So I see a look. So the example is my roofer. A roofer might line item out all the roofing stuff. But then there's a little bit of electrical and a little bit of plumbing. And so on their estimate, they'll say electrical subcontractor, 50,000, plumbing subcontractor, 75,000. Well, this is a construction task catalog. It has electrical and plumbing in it. And even if you are subcontracting it out, the pricing still has to come from the price book. It cannot be the subcontractor's quote plus your markup. So this is an example of what an estimate could or should look like. Um, there's many different softwares out there. So the information will be the same, but the format might be different. This is hard to see. I know that you'll have a printout. It's probably not any better. Um, but we do have this PowerPoint available online, choicepartners.org, about us, presentations, and then you can click on like the vendor workshop, any of them, and download that PDF and you can see this, okay? Also, if you have a job order contract and you're not sure how to use RS means, we will train you. There's no cost to you. You can come to us, we can come to you, we can do it virtually, doesn't matter. You need help creating your first or second estimate, we'll help you create it, we'll work with you. Okay, there is no cost to you for this. The only time you pay Choice Partners is if you have an administrative fee for a project. Make sense? So we work with you, you, you give them the bid, you don't get awarded the project, you don't owe a dime. <clears throat> First thing at the top, I have that contract number. Right under that is the data release. This says 2019 quarter two. Our contracts require the most current quarter, right? So I'm probably gonna make you update that to 2023 quarter three. Quantity, that's how many of each line item is used. The line number follows CSI master format. It's 12 digits. And your client can type that number into uh, the unit price book to determine if you've manipulated this line in any way. Okay. The description says what's included in that line. Anything not in that description is another line item. Okay. So let's say you grabbed a piece of equipment rental. Okay. You're renting a lift and it didn't include the person to run it. Well, then you could have another line item for the person to run it. Make sense? Unit of measure, choice partners contracts, especially with RS means, we specify right-hand means. So that means we specify the pricing columns that include overhead and profit in them, okay? So any pricing column that you use should say OMP at the end of it. So total OMP, extended total OMP, those are the pricing columns for this. Since OMP is already included there, we should never see extra line items at the bottom for additional overhead and profit. Okay, the pricing includes overhead and profit. Your coefficient increases it or decreases it, and that's the price. CCI, City Cost Index. That's where I talked about us uh, bringing it down off the national average. So if I looked here and it said national average, I'd know you didn't apply the CCI. Okay, CCI is based on the first three digits of the zip code. 
Um, it does give a city name. It's the largest city in that zip code. So um, 775 says Galveston, but I know that 775 is also Laporte. It's also Baytown. We're not really worried about this city. We're worried about those first three digits. The note section, very handy. Um, if you're providing something that's similar, but not the same as the description, instead of editing the description, you'll type in the notes what it is you're providing. You can do your, your quantity calculations and takeoffs in that box. You can tell them where these things are being located. So with federal funds, a lot of times they want to say 70% of that line item went to the high school, 10% went to the chiller yard, and 20% went to the field house. So you can break it down, okay? Anytime you do any editing, it should only be in this column. It should never be anywhere else. If it is anywhere else, then under labor type, it'll say user. And that lets me know that you've manipulated something. That's how I know to check. It gives me a total at the bottom, and that's where you insert your legally big coefficient and reduce that number down you can give them an additional discount. So your pricing is not to exceed. If you choose to give them an additional discount, you can. I always recommend though, that you put some sort of stipulation on there, like discount good for current project only, or discount good for 90 days, okay? Not indefinitely. The software does allow you to add performance and payment bonds into it, permitting, all of that. But we ask you to put it at the end of your estimate as a pass-through cost. So when you put it up here, it gets discounted by that coefficient, right? We're asking you just to charge them what you pay. Don't mark it up. Don't discount it. And then you'll get the new total, which is cut off because I zoomed in. Review the job quote. This is something that we teach the members. This is what we look for when we review these quotes. Okay, so they say, hey, I'm doing business with XYZ. They gave me this proposal. Will you check it for compliance against your contract? And we check it for these eight things. Okay, so city cost index. Was it applied correctly? Did you use the correct coefficient? Did you use the overhead and profit pricing column? Is the data released the most recent? Non-pre-priced line items, did you use them? And if you did, did you follow the contract language? And does the funding source allow for it? So to understand, federally funded projects do not allow non-pre-priced line items because they're cost plus, okay? So when the funding source is federal, you should not ever use a non-pre-priced line item. <clears throat> Attempts to pass through the cooperative fee. That's included in the definition of coefficient in your contract. Therefore, it cannot be a separate charge, okay? Use of division one. We restrict the use of division one. So division one is all of your overhead items, okay? Um, it includes things like equipment rental, which we do allow. But it also includes stuff like your office, your secretary, your cell phone, your tr truck, your gas, et cetera, et cetera. And we do not allow the use of those items, okay? If you're ever unsure of which items we do and do not allow, you can go to section one of the CSP that you responded to, and there is a definition for coefficient, and it tells you what's included. Those are line items that you cannot use. You can also go to section eight under pricing, and we have that definition there as well. And then adjustment factors. We do allow these to be used, but we bring them to your client's attention. Um, depending on the estimating software you're using, some of them hide these adjustment factors pretty well. Someone that doesn't work in the software regularly won't be able to identify it. We bring it to their attention and just make them aware of it. What do we not get into? We do not get into your scope, your specs, your takeoffs, your quantities. That is between you and that member. We do not get into that. 
we only review it against the contract terms. Y'all really quiet. Y'all overwhelmed yet? <laughs> no? Well, you're laughing, so at least you're listening. All right. So the job order is it should be issued by the governmental entity. It should be signed by both parties. It should include the scope of work and the price. And it should provide their adopted prevailing wage rate schedule. They should also give you their insurance requirements. Choice Partners stipulates a minimum insurance requirement, but it may not meet their minimum requirement. They, they may decide they want what... So, so the deal is, is we state the minimum that the state of Texas requires, but they have the option for additional insurance if they want it, okay? So if they're going to require it, they need to give that to you. <clears throat> With job order contracting, there's... there's a lot of misunderstanding, and a lot of it is because of Texas. Texas doesn't like to do it the way that everybody else does it. Um, but the deal here is, is that your clients might get three, four, five quotes. And you say, well, you can't do that legally. You can't rebid me. You can't recompete me. If they're asking you to rebid your coefficient, you're absolutely correct. They should not be asking you to bid different coefficients. But if they are asking you to give them a quote based on what you bid to choice partners, they can get as many as they want. So the bidder proposal is the vendor's formal written sealed response that satisfies the state's procurement requirements. It is what you gave to choice partners. That is the bid. That's all. Everything that you issue after that is a quote. Okay? So the quote is once our clients, once your clients have projects and they develop a scope of work and they ask for job-specific pricing based on that scope of work, they have to get one. If they're using certain federal funds like FEMA, they have to get three. And one of those three is supposed to come from a minority-owned or woman-owned business or their local policy may require more than one. But otherwise, they're only, they only have to get one. All right. <clears throat> so some final thoughts. Uh, you want to make sure that you establish the procurement method up front with your client prior to quoting the job. The deal here I see a lot is they ask you to come give them a quote. You give them a quote. Then they come back to you and say, well, wait, are you on a co-op? And a lot of times the vendors will say, yeah, just add 2% to that price and we're good. But did you bid your off the street price plus 2%? Is that what the contract that was bid likely states? The answer is no. So if you do your off the street price plus 2% and it gets sent back to anyone for compliance checking or auditing, you're gonna to have to go back and back it into the unit price book and apply your coefficient. And then you're stuck with wherever that number lands. Make sense? You always wanna establish that pricing method. We see it a lot um, with, with universities, with larger school districts, they do an internal contract. Maybe it's good for four million a year, but they run six million through you, and the other two million they run through a co-op, and no one knows it. And it gets reported to the co-op. You accepted the PO with it on there, and now you're on the hook for that cooperative fee that you didn't take into account. Because once you accept the PO with the contract number on there, you accept all the terms of the contract. Now, how many of you in sales get the PO direct? How many of you does it go to somebody else in your office and you never see it? Yeah. But when these governmental entities put a cooperative contract on there, they're wanting the rebates. And so they're reporting it to the co-op as a purchase through them. 
They issued you a PO with that contract number on there. You accepted it. You're now on the hook. So these conversations are imperative to have so that nobody gets caught off guard. We've seen it happen a lot. Um, and, and usually it's always the member never had the discussion with you. Contract numbers should always be on the quote and the PO. If they don't ask for a contract number, put one on there. At least it opens a conversation for them to come back and tell you to change it, right? Choice partners. Um, I know Steve said something about quarterly reporting earlier. Most of choice partners contracts are actually monthly reporting. And all of the construction contracts are monthly reporting. Our supply catalog had quarterly reporting, but we no longer have that. Um, and so with the exception of food, I think food is different. Um, and I'm not even going to try to explain that one because each contract's different. But the majority of Choice Partners contracts now are monthly reporting, okay? If you need something else set up, then you'll talk to um, the person that sends you the invoice to set that up. And that's it. Any questions? We feeling overwhelmed? Concerns? About anything today? If you didn't already fill out the survey, please go ahead. For the people here, we have little tent cards on your tables. People online, here's the QR code. You can scan it. <clears throat> here's the contacts for everybody that works at Choice Partners. Please feel re free to reach out to us. If you don't know who to reach out to, just pick one of them. We'll get it to the right person. I promise. All right. Thank you all for coming.